Uh, we'll be doing uh, this very specific IEC on taming the oblique muscles. We have with us uh, Dr. Meenakshi Ravindran, Chief Medical Officer, Aravindai Hospital, Tirunelveli. Um, actually, the Chief Instructor is Dr. Divya Kishan, who could not make it today. I'll be doing the presentation on her behalf. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Arya A.R. presenting uh, Anatomy and Physiology of Oblique Muscles and Pulleys. Good afternoon. The outset, let me thank ASOS and Dr. Divya Kishan for giving me such an opportunity today. My topic is Anatomy of Oblique Muscles. So this is a lateral view in which you can see the rectile muscles coming from the common tendinous ring of zin and coming forwards. And superiorly, you can see the superior oblique muscle and the inferior oblique muscle. So coming to superior oblique, it is the longest and thinnest muscle. The direct part is about 40 millimeters. And the reflected part is 19.5 millimeters. And it originates from the body of sphenoid from above and medial to the optic foramen. It moves forwards between the roof and medial part of orbit. Once it reaches the trochlea, it turns posterolaterally and it gets inserted behind the equator. The reflected tendon passes under the superiorectus muscle and fans out. So the primary action of the muscle is intorsion, secondary is depression and abduction, and the anterior fibers are mainly meant for intorsion and the posterior fibers for depression. So in the adducted position, it acts as a depressor, and in the abducted, it causes intorsion only. And this is a picture from above, which shows the uh, rectile muscles going, and this is specifically the superior oblique muscle. In, from the superior view, where you can see it is originating from the body of sphenoid, coming forwards. Once it hooks the trochlea, it turns posterolaterally at an angle of 54 degree, and then gets inserted onto the sclera behind the equator. This is a lateral view. This is again the lateral view of the oblique muscles getting inserted. Coming to the inferior oblique, it is the shortest muscle. It is around 37 millimeters long. It is only EOM extraocular muscle attached near front of the orbit. It originates as a rounded tendon from the orbital plate of maxilla, just lateral to the orifice of nasolacrimal duct, talks laterally and posteriorly around the globe and passes between the inferior rectus and floor of the orbit. The action is primary action is extortion and secondary is elevation and abduction. And at 51 degrees of adduction, it's only an elevator and 39 degrees of abduction, the action is only extortion. So this is basically a slide to uh, show you how what is intorsion that from the 12 o'clock to the medial position. And now this is a small uh, video, it's an animated video showing the origin and insertion of the oblique muscles. So the superior oblique is noted in a blue color which passes under the superior rectus and the inferior oblique is denoted in green color in the video. Now as I have already told it originates from the body of sphenoid comes forwards, runs parallel to the medial orbital wall, above the medial rectus muscle. Once it reaches the trochlea, it passes posterolaterally. And then it gets inserted, passes under the superior rectus muscle, fan, it, it fans out and then inserts into the sclera behind the equator. So uh, the superior oblique actions are depression, abduction, and intorsion. And the superior oblique is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve, that is the trochlear nerve. Now it is the inferior oblique. It is the only muscle that comes from anterior part. The video you can see it is uh, denoted in green color. It passes backwards.
and gets inserted into the sclera as shown in the video. This is the lateral lectus that is shown above. And the actions are elevation, abduction, and lateral rotation. And uh, the inferior oblique is supplied by the third cranial nerve or ocular motor nerve. And coming to the blood supply, there are two for each recta except the lateral lectus which receives only one branch. That's about the recta and in the, as shown in the chart, the inferior oblique is supplied by the middle muscular artery and superior oblique by the lateral muscular artery. Now coming to what are these muscle pulleys, as the extraocular muscle penetrates the tenens capsule, the connective tissue forms the sleeves around the muscles, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> creating muscle pulleys. And these are discrete rings of dense collagen tissue encircling the extraocular muscles and they are about 2 millimeters in length. And the pulley redirects the muscle and acts as a functional origin. It also prevents displacement of the muscle during the movement. And just to show the action of the superior oblique and inferior oblique, in dextro depression, it is your right inferior rectus and left superior oblique acting. And in levo depression, it is your left inferior rectus and right superior oblique. Coming to dextro elevation, it is your right superior rectus and left inferior oblique, and vivo elevation, left superior rectus and right inferior oblique. So, last point about the fixed axis that is uh, how the extraocular movement takes place. Along the x axis, <coughs> elevation and depression takes place. And along the y axis or the andro posterior, torsional movements that is extorsion or intorsion takes place, and instead of vertical axis, <coughs> adduction and abduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arya. Now, uh, the next talk is on evaluation of oblique muscle dysfunction, which was supposed to be done by our chief instructor. I'll be speaking on her behalf and then be proceeding to my own topic. Uh, uh, so happy to be here. I am presenting before my mentor, and my students, and somebody whom I taught some uh, months ago, and there is my batchmate, there is my school friend, and a new friend. Thank you very much. So, uh, superior oblique and inferior oblique muscles, uh, with their range of primary, secondary, and tertiary actions, are involved in cyclotorsions and vertical ductions. It is virtually impossible to differentiate one action of the oblique from the other. So their dysfunction basically produces a cyclovertical strabismus. Typically, cyclovertical strabismus, uh, we see that comitance is rare. Sensory adaptations like amblyopia, ARC are less frequent. The magnitude of deviation would be small. Nevertheless, it would be very symptomatic because of the low vertical fusional reserve. The normal vertical fusional reserve being 3 to 5 prism diopters. So these are the, this is the entire list of various etiologies of cyclovertical deviations. When will you suspect a cyclovertical deviation clinically? Patient would come with complaints of vertical diplopia. An intelligent patient would specifically tell you that the second image is tilted with regard to the first. And the other complaints would be asthenopic symptoms like blurring or headache. There would be an, optical, uh, uh, would be an obvious uh, vertical misalignment, which could be cosmetically disfiguring. Some patients will tell you this, that straight away. And there can be an anomalous head posture with associated neck discomfort. So signs, vertical deviation would be present, extraocular dysmotility, a pattern deviation, and a fund distortion can be seen. So this is how Von Norden has classified cyclovertical deviations. So as is routine, we go ahead with a history taking and examination with special stress on age of onset, duration of altered head posture, uh, history of trauma, drug intake, comorbidities like diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, history of sinus surgeries, and always probe into a family history of squint, go for a FAT scan, familial album tomography. So this is the protocol that we follow. Note every single point. These are the ancillary clinical tests we go for in case of cyclover suspected cyclovertical deviations. So we'll be coming to each of it in detail. So anomalous head posture, uh, we, this is something which needs special attention, document it straight away. You can quantitate it with an instrument called goniometer. 
and a photographic documentation also helps. Always differentiate an ocular cause from a non-ocular cause. So what is the easiest way of doing that? You patch one eye, observe the child. If the torticollis improves after patching of one eye, it suggests an ocular etiology. If it does not improve, it suggests a musculoskeletal cause. See, look for facial asymmetry. It is important because in cases of congenital facial nerve palsy, congenital uh, superior oblique palsy, there will be a flattening of the face on the affected side. So that, why does it occur? Because of restriction of normal facial growth by persistent muscle pull on the facial bones to one side. Now, very important it is to observe and document the ocular rotations in detail. Go see the versions first, look for any asymmetry, document the ductions, Note the limitations in all nine gaze positions. A properly performed assessment of ocular rotations will give you an idea about the competence of the deviation. Grade your inferior oblique, superior oblique limitations. Different grading systems are available for that. And uh, you can actually uh, go for an on-the-spot photographic documentation by using apps like this, nine gaze app. And while you check the mortality patterns, do not miss Findings like upshoots, downshoots, as we get in Brown syndrome and DRS. Coexistent features like globe retraction and narrowing or widening of the palpebral fissure also should be picked up at this juncture. So we go ahead with the first and foremost screening test, that is the Hirschberg's corneal reflex test. So here in this example, we see that the left eye appears to be up. You see the corneal reflex displaced slightly towards the inferior aspect of the pupillary area. So this is a left hyperdeviation. So what is your next plan? You go ahead with the cover, uncover, alternate cover test. You see the very obvious alternating hypertropia. And then you quantify your deviation with prism cover test. Remember, in the case of a suspected cyclovertical deviation, uh, you have to uh, do the tests in right and left head tilts after going for measurement in all nine gaze positions for near, far. And in case of associated horizontal deviations, neutralize them first and then neutralize your uh, vertical deviations also. Do not miss uh, to document the pattern deviations. This is how you finally make a documentation of nine gaze measurements. Uh, go ahead with assessment of BSV by making use of worth 4 dot test that has to be done for both distance and near and Bagolini striated glasses. Stereopsis tests have to be done for both again distance and near and uh, examination of the fundus is important to pick up any posterior segment pathology that is contributing to the deviation and it is also imperative to go for a cycloplegic refraction. Assessment and grading of fundus torsion also is very important, especially in a case of suspected cyclovertical deviation. So these are the ancillary tests that you do, versions you have already done and while performing your version assessment, you can do PARC three-step tests side by side. So in this example, you see that there is a left hyperdeviation. So what is the first step? You will isolate all the four, I mean eight muscles in both the eyes involved in cyclovertical movements. So you have uh, marked all your eight muscles. So left hyperdeviation means it is due to weakness of the left eye depressors. What are they? Superior oblique and inferior rectus in the left eye. Or it could be because of weakness of the elevators of the right eye. They are right superior rectus and right inferior oblique. So step one is done. Go to step two. You see that the left hyperdeviation is increasing in right gaze and it is not so in the left gaze. So you have to identify the vertically acting muscles in each eye in right gaze. So what are the vertically acting muscles in right gaze in the right eye? They are the superior rectus and inferior rectus and in the left eye it is the left inferior oblique and left superior oblique. Third is the Belshovsky's head, head tilt test. In that tilt photo, you see that the left hyperdeviation appears to be more in left head tilt, and towards the right, it is, the, it is not uh, uh, very obvious. So what do you understand? On your, on your til when you tilt your head towards the left, your right eye should extort and your left eye should intort, right? On tilting to the left, your right eye should extort and your left eye should intort. So what are the intorters, uh, extorters of the right eye. Extorters are inferior oblique and inferior rectus in the right eye and intorters of the left eye are left superior rectus and left superior oblique. So you see that the left superior oblique gets marked thrice. 
So that is the culprit muscle. So this patient has a left superior oblique palsy. So this looks quite easy, but remember the test has its own set of fallacies. These are, these are the entities where Park 3 step doesn't work well. Measurement of torsion by subjective method, you can make use of a double Maddox rod. Uh, the patient has to rotate the rod, still the line images are seen parallel to each other. The problem is that it does not localize the abnormal eye. Now, any patient comes to you with diplopia, you have to chart a diplopia charting. Uh, test is done at one, cent one meter testing distance. The patient has to identify areas of single vision and double vision, see whether it is crossed or uncrossed, look for tilts, and he has to report the position of maximum separation of images. So these are the examples. Again, HES chart is there to uh, diagnose and monitor the incompetence of deviation. Uh, remember, you have to first look at the smaller chart, identify the eye with the affected muscle, and the degree of disparity between the plotted point and template in any position of gaze gives an estimate of the angle of deviation. So this is the HES chart of a right acquired fourth cranial nerve palsy, and this is that of the left eye. Sorry, this is that of a congenital right superior oblique palsy. Now, you remember to do a vertical fusional amplitude test whenever you are suspecting a congenital superior oblique palsy. So this is one test which helps to differentiate a congenital SO palsy from, a, uh, from an acquired one. And large fusional amplitudes are typically considered evidence that SO palsy is congenital. Uh, finally, you have to uh, proceed to Guyton's exaggerated FDT to evaluate tightness of the oblique muscles. So this is how you do. Remember to retropulse the globe uh, while you perform uh, exaggerated FDT of uh, uh, obliques. And uh, you have to move the globe supranasally, and then the globe is rocked temporarily to evaluate for the tightness of the superior oblique muscle. And then you can grade the tightness as well. So same thing has to be repeated in the opposite direction for testing inferior oblique. So these are the common things which we see in our clinics. So superior oblique palsy, inferior oblique overaction, uh, Brown syndrome, paresis of inferior oblique, etc. So uh, basically, I think we, if we follow this protocol, we can maybe identify clinically itself the involved muscle. Thank you very much. Now I'll be moving to my presentation, restrictive pathologies on obliques. So um, ocular restriction is the result of either a mechanical tether on eye movements or a leash. Leash is a misdirected force that works against normal agonist function. So with regard to the oblique muscles, we can classify the causes of ocular restriction into these four headings. Could be the result of a tight extraocular muscle as in congenital Brown syndrome, thyroid myopathy or local anesthetic myotoxicity or because of structural adhesions, as in acquired Brown syndrome, fat adherence to the muscle or sclera, or congenital fibrotic bands. Then the third group involves orbital mass or a glaucoma explant with a large blood. Finally, it could be the result of misdirected muscle forces. So these are the headings which we would come to. So Brown syndrome, commonly seen among these list of uh, entities. Uh, consistent findings include deficient elevation in adduction, minimal or no elevation deficit in abduction, minimal or no superior oblique overaction, restricted force ductions, V pattern with divergence in upgaze. Less consistent findings include hypotropia in primary position, anomalous head posture with maintained binocular single vision and down shoot in adduction. And globe proptosis in attempted upgaze has been thought to be virtually diagnostic of this condition. So this is how you classify brown. You have congenital and acquired, and in each you have a true congenital brown and a pseudo-congenital brown, true acquired brown and pseudo-acquired brown. So true brown congenital uh, is due to inelastic muscle tendon complex. Pseudo-congenital brown, the result of anomalous inferior, oblique, inferior orbital adhesions. True acquired brown, the result of peritrochlear scarring or adhesions, inflammation or edema. Pseudo-acquired brown, the result of floor fracture or inferior temporal additions. So we already know the pattern of evaluation for a suspected oblique palsy or oblique restriction. Uh, if you suspect an acquired brown from history or clinical examination, order for additional lab investigations like ESR, RA factor, ANA, and imaging has a definite role. So these are the differential diagnosis of superior oblique palsy, uh, sorry, uh, brown syndrome. Uh, 
you have to differentiate it basically from inferior oblique paresis. Uh, here you would have superior oblique overaction, A pattern, a positive head tilt, and it, FDT would be negative. In monocular elevation deficit, the deficit will be present in both adduction and abduction. Congenital fibrosis syndrome characterized by limitation of all extraocular movements. And finally, you have to differentiate it from thyroid orbitopathy and orbital floor fracture. In this situation, the elevation deficit will be more in abduction, inferior rectus being the mostly involved muscle. So definite indications are there for managing a Brown syndrome. Indications include primary position hypotropia or when there is a loss of anomalous head posture, which suggests loss of binocularity and there is a risk for amblyopia in that situation. Observation is advised, but uh, do not expect a spontaneous regression in congenital brown. Acquired brown, systemic evaluation is mandatory. You treat the systemic condition, and local injection of corticosteroid in the region of trochlea is an accepted method of treatment. Surgical treatment, madam would be elaborating on that. These are the different surgical procedures uh, carried out. Now, there is a, this thing called iatrogenic Brown syndrome, the result of superior oblique tightening procedures. So you can actually prevent it by avoiding over tightening of the superior oblique tendon. This is also seen in glaucoma valve surgeries or following scleral buckling or following sinus surgeries which damage the tendon trochlea complex. Uh, then comes the anti-elevation syndrome, which is a characterized by limitation of elevation in the abducting eye due to restriction produced by the transposed inferior oblique muscle. And there would be a pseudo inferior oblique overaction in the adducting eye following Herring's law of equal innervation. So this is the image. Now why does this occur? With placement of inferior oblique muscle, more than one millimeter anterior to the insertion of the inferior rectus muscle in IO80, or when the new inferior oblique insertion is played or spread too widely following IO80, this particular syndrome happens. That is because the uh, posterior fibers of the inferior oblique carry the neurovascular bundle, and when the posterior fibers are anteriorized, this ant neurovascular bundle tethers the eye, thus limiting elevation. So treatment is revisiting the tra revising the uh, transposed inferior oblique insertion, moving it more posteriorly, and then causing it to bunch at the new point of insertion. It should not be splayed. And when you, sus when you have already created an anti-elevation syndrome by performing IO-80 in one eye, maybe you can go for a balanced anti-elevation in the other eye by repeating the same in the other eye. That is also advocated. Now, uh, I came across this thing uh, suggested by Dr. David Hunter. It is inferior oblique myotoxicity from local anesthetic injection, uh, characterized by delayed onset hypertropia with definite fundus extortion in an eye that has undergone a surgery and it is consistent with inferior oblique overaction secondary to presumed contracture of the inferior oblique. So the proposed mechanism is like peribulbar block causing localized muscle damage to inferior oblique. Both lignocaine and bupivacaine have been uh, uh, thought to produce a damage. Here the muscle fibers get replaced by fibroblasts. Fibroblast proliferation further results in contracture of the inferior oblique which manifests late as hypertropia, fundus extortion, and diplopia. Uh, resolution on weakening of the contractured inferior oblique uh, was also supportive of this uh, entity. Uh, another uh, entity described by Dr. Kushner is superior oblique tendon incarceration syndrome. It also produces a restrictive oblique cyclovertical deviation characterized by restrictive hypertropia and incyclotropia following prior surgeries on superior rectus, superior oblique, or scleral buckling. So they say that to prevent this, proper handling of the connections between superior rectus and superior oblique are to be uh, done. Uh, finally, you have this inferior oblique muscle adherence syndrome. Uh, again, following uh, surgeries on superior rectus, uh, following uh, scleral buckling or surgery on inferior rectus, uh, causing restrictive hypotropia and excyclotropia. Uh, thyroid ophthalmopathy characterized by rectus involvement is something which we frequently see. But uh, here is this report which uh, suggests superior oblique muscle involvement. And this MRI is showing bilateral asymmetric superior oblique muscle enlargement, the right eye being larger than the left. All the other rectus muscles are also enlarged. 
So it's actually good to know about these rare entities also because the surgeon can plan well ahead of uh, your uh, procedure for the precise surgical outcome in all these cyclovertical deviations. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Rashmi Baskar, Senior Consultant, Shaitanya Eye Hospital, Trivandrum, for her talk on inferior oblique surgeries. Thank you, Dr. Samyukta. I should thank Dr. Divya and KSOs also for giving me this opportunity. My topic is surgeries on the inferior oblique muscle. Inferior oblique muscle is very unique in anatomy, function, response to surgery and appearance. So, uh, when we check the history of the inferior oblique surgery, we know it was first proposed by Duane in 1906 as a transcutaneous tenotomy. Later, Dun Dunnington in 1929 suggested this insertion. White was the first to introduce recession in 1943 and Park introduced various weakening procedures. Coming to the indications of inferior oblique surgery, V pattern strabismus with inferior oblique overaction, primary inferior oblique overaction as you see in infantile esotropia, exotropia and even in accommodative esotropia, dissociated vertical deviation, superior oblique palsy, X cyclotorsion, nystagmus with a head tilt, and rare indications include Duane's retraction syndrome with uh, innovational upshoots, sensory hypertropia, lost or severed or replace of the inferior rectus, contralateral eye of superior rectus palsy or MAD. And contraindications include V pattern without an inferior oblique overaction, X pattern in case of a long-standing exotropia, apparent overaction craniofacial syndromes, and in some post-RD surgery, when there is an in-cyclotorsion as well as an inferior oblique overaction. Coming to the surgical procedures, the various inferior oblique weakening procedures include myotomy, myectomy, denervation and extirpation, recessions, anterior transpositioning, anterior nasal transpositioning, nasal myectomy, and inferior oblique y splitting. The commonly done procedures are myectomy, recessions, and anterior transpositioning. And the inferior oblique y splitting and nasal myectomy are certain new procedures. Coming to the isolation of the muscle, you take an inferotemporal incision, 8 mm from the limbus, and perpendicular incisions are made at the tenons to expose the bare sclera. This is a video showing you taking the inferotemporal incision, the conjunctiva is split, and you visualize, you can now see the inferior oblique muscle that is lying transversely, and you hook the muscle under direct visualization. The surgical anatomy, the muscle is 9 millimeter wide, inclined posterolaterally. The maximum recession that you can do is 12 millimeters. When you are doing a procedure in inferior oblique, you should take care of the surrounding structures like vortex vein, macula is close to the insertion, and orbital fat so that you avoid the complications. Before cutting the muscle, always make sure that you hook the lateral rectus as well as the inferior rectus. And this is an old video which I had uh, from my fellowship time. It's, uh, this is done by, this is a procedure, uh, myotomy actually done by TSSR. You can see he has hooked the muscle and he has clamped. And cut the muscle, you cauterize it and leave it alone. When you take 8 to 10 millimeter of the uh, muscle and then you clamp on either side, you cut the muscle, then it becomes a myomectomy. What is the advantage of myectomy? It is easy to perform. The less, less time consuming and complications are also less. And disadvantage is it is irreversible. If you want to do any resurgery on that, it will be going and attaching somewhere on the sleeve. You won't be able to pinpoint out where it has attached. And the resurgery is not possible. And the results are unpredictable. Coming to the inferior oblique recession, you hook the muscle like you have uh, told before and you clamp the muscle close to the insertion. And you cut the muscle from the insertion. After cutting and securing it in a clamp, you take the sutures. Two double arm sutures are taken with a 6-0 vicryl on either side and you secure the muscle.
Now the inferior rectus is hooked and you mark the inferior uh, 3 millimeter behind and 2 millimeter lateral to the lateral border of the inferior rectus. The muscle is acquired in position. After securing the muscle in position, you tighten the knot and you can close the conjunctiva with interrupted sutures or with continuous suture. Now the finger recession is 8 millimeter recession where the muscle is placed 6 millimeter inferior and posterior to lateral rectus. And the park recession that you do for moderate inferior oblique overaction is 10 millimeter recession, as we have seen now, 3 millimeter posterior and 2 millimeter lateral to the inferior rectus. Now, with andro positioning, muscle is embunched up and placed adjacent to the lateral end of inferior rectus. It is indicated in case of DVD and unilateral SO palsy with a hypertrophy. This is a child with inferior oblique overaction, large V pattern along with a DVD. And we had done an inferior oblique uh, anterization in this patient. Yeah, but the problem is it can cause anti-elevation syndrome as Dr. Samyukta has already told. The neuromuscular bundle of the inferior oblique that inserts the posterior prevent it from elevating. For, by, for minimizing the anti-elevation, you can place 1 to 2 millimeter posterior to the lateral border of inferior rectus. The modified iliot and ankin recession is almost anterior end will be the same. The only difference is the posterior end will be inserted 5 millimeter posterior along the lateral border so that the anti-elevation effect will be reduced and it has less andropositioning effect. In anterior nasal transposition, the new insertion will be 2 mm nasal and posterior to the na nasal border of the inferior rectus. In this case, the inferior oblique will be transferred from an uh, extorter to an intorter as well as a depressor. So the new insertion will be nasal to the inferior rectus. Anterior nasal transposition is indicated in bilateral fourth nerve palsy and over elevation with severe excyclo torsion as in cranial dysostosis. Advantage is that it avoids the anti-elevation syndrome. Then now, nasal myectomy. In case of residual inferior oblique overaction after anterization, the nasal part of the inferior oblique is cut. And the Y splitting is you split the inferior oblique and the posterior part of the Y end is placed posteriorly so that it will prevent the anti-elevation. This also has been described recently. These are the various graded recessions. Uh, that you can fr from behind as yes, it reaches the anterior part of the uh, inferior rectus, the weakening effect will be more. Now, inferior oblique advancement, usually the inferior oblique strengthening procedures are rarely mentioned and done. Inferior oblique advancement has been studied by Goldstein and it is indicated in A pattern isotropia, where you disinsert the inferior oblique, pass it under the lateral rectus and attaches to sclera 2 to 3 millimeters superior to the lateral rectus and 8 millimeter posteriorly. Coming to the complications of the inferior oblique uh, surgeries, hemorrhage, if you disrupt the vortex vein, uh, there will be massive hemorrhage and retrobulbar hemorrhage and all. Persistent pupillary dilatation, uh, transient pupillary dilatation because you nerve to inferior oblique when damage, injury to the lateral rectus, macular trauma when you, if you are inserting and taking bite by accidental injury, under correction, anti-elevation and fat adherence. Visualize and proceed in case when you are doing an inferior oblique surgery. Isolate the entire muscle. If the muscle is not fully hooked, it can result in under correction. Avoid the vortex vein to prevent hemorrhage. And dissect close to muscle to avoid fat adherence and avoid disrupting the orbital fat complex so that the fat adherence will be prevented. And keep new insertion behind the inferior rectus with posterior fibers posteriorly so that anti elevation can be prevented. Thank you. Thank you, Rishmi, madam, for that. Please welcome Dr. Meenakshi Ravindran, Chief Medical Officer and uh, Head of Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Services, Aravindai Hospital, Tirunelveli. Madam would be speaking on surgeries on superior oblique muscle, when and how. Uh, good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank the management committee of KSOS and Divya Kishan and Samyukta for giving me this opportunity. 
so my talk is on surgeries of on superior oblique when and how part of my talk has been made easy because of the excellent uh, presentation of the anatomy especially she showed it very beautifully in that video if anybody uh, those who have seen will understand when we are talking about the surgery and of course samyukta she is always uh, evaluated and uh, so uh, a small this thing on the surgery surgical anatomy what we should know about it is the uh, even though the muscle is originating near the sphenoid and the optic foramen what we are concerned is only after the trochlea that is the functional origin trochlea is the functional origin for superior oblique all our surgeries are there only from the after the trochlea so and you should always remember these two points the anterior fibers and posterior fibers nowhere else like inferior rectus we don't talk about anterior posterior or superior inferior but only in superior oblique we talk about anterior portion and posterior portion so anterior portion is responsible anterior one third is responsible for insertion and posterior for the abduction and depression so why this is very important is any surgery is planned based on the functional aspect so coming to the uh, surgeries on superior oblique you will have the weakening strengthening or transpositioning procedures so first this we'll talk about when i have taken based on the case scenarios i am not uh, uh, talking like theory like so case scenario uh, so it can be a pattern strabismus or a restrictive pathology or a paralytic pathology so this is case number 1 a 15 year old child coming with squinting best corrected 66 uh, both eyes with a 20 degree exotropia in primary case no head posture and you can obviously see the uh, superior oblique over action in the right eye 3 plus and you can see the difference in the gaze up gaze and down gaze for a pattern it should be more than at least 10 prism diopters which it is there and for v pattern it is 15 here a it is 10 and there is a dbd also in this child so what is the diagnosis this is actually helvestan syndrome because there is an associated dbd also so this is a pattern xt with uh, so over action with dbd so what did we do for this case we went ahead with the superior oblique weakening procedure what we did was left eye lateral rectus resection with medial rectus resection with posterior retinectomy of the superior oblique so this is uh, once again a uh, fornix based incision uh, isolate the superior rectus and then it is on the temporal side temporal side of the superior rectus and you can see the fan shaped muscle uh, it will be stuck to the sclera so when you are isolating the superior oblique what we have to remember is all the adhesions have to be removed and this is a simple procedure posterior retinectomy you just have to cut the posterior part of the muscle alone around 10 mm you can cut to decrease the action of the uh, to collapse the a pattern so so why we are doing this we are not doing the touching the anterior portion if you touch the anterior portion you will cause a iatrogenic diplopia a torsional diplopia to the patient so just touch the posterior fibers alone so that you will collapse the a pattern and these are the studies which have quoted the results where they have done 22 cases and pattern has collapsed in 20 patients so this is the pre op and the post op picture you can see the eye has become straight and you can see the oblique over action decreased also and the pattern has collapsed case number 2 a 4 year old child squinting noticed by parents when the child looks up at them uncorrected 66 as you can see there is no squinting in primary gaze there is limitation of elevation in adduction in both the eyes you can see it is there and uh, what do you do next do you do any surgery now no you need not do any surgery for this child it's just wait and watch because there is no he head posture no uh, head tilt or uh, no deviation in the primary gaze no need to do any surgery but this is case number 3 31 years old male squint since childhood in right eye you can obviously see the uh, li limitation can you see the uh, elevation is limited on adduction and it is almost minus 4 and you can also see the down shoot 
when he is when he is adducting in the right eye shows a down shoot this was cosmetically causing a problem to him so he wanted and there was a l by r also he he, he found it very difficult and he wanted for cosmetic purpose uh, surgical intervention so we went ahead and did squint surgery so what did we do for this case it's a right congenital brown syndrome so before we i go on and tell what we did for this particular case do we intervene for all cases of congenital browns no we are intervening only when there is compensatory severe compensatory head posture a vertical strabismus in primary position or a troublesome diplopia this particular patient had a vertical strabismus in primary position as well as he had cosmetically unacceptable down shoot so what did we do we uh, lengthened the superior oblique so we did a nap sick chicken suture this is the video from sandra i have taken uh, before doing any procedure in any whether it is a horizontal or vertical always do a fdt you can see the taut superior oblique and uh, once again you go ahead with the phonix based incision or a larger incision if you are not uh, uh, this thing so here uh, the medial side you have to operate on the medial side for lengthening procedure not on the lateral aspect so once again hook the superior rectus and uh, when you are hooking the use the desmers retractor to give have a better exposure uh, on the nasal side it's much more easier you can see the identify the muscle very easily so nicely stretch the muscle all the attachments you have to uh, uh, what to say release it all the other attachments otherwise what uh, dr rashmi told will happen you have adherence and then you will cause some iatrogenic uh, restrictions so mark how much you want to have a, a 4 mm or 8 mm uh, this thing uh, you mark that much and use a non absorbable suture it is a 50 ethy bond which is used and uh, you create a loop between the two uh, markings which we have made so the surgical part is not so difficult only thing is you have to make sure that you have weakening at taut superior oblique so that is the most important thing so between the loops you just cut the ethy bond suture you will have the check the suture holding the this thing so in a silicon expander you are using a right silicon expander instead of using a suture you use a silicon tube of the or uh, a silicon band which we use in the retina so uh, the main problem with this is when you are taking the loops you can tangle it so that is the only difficulties you can have otherwise it's a very simple procedure you can see the uh, this thing uh, cut it and then cut the muzzle in between uh, and you get the lengthening whichever whatever you uh, aim for and always do the fdt to see if it is become lax you can see no you can see at that time it was so taut now you can see it is not so taut so this is the pre and the post op picture you can see here the down shoot has decreased and the elevation it is uh, at least it is uh, crossing the uh, it is not uh, so much restricted now that much only we can give in any restrictive strabismus and uh, the deviation has decreased the left hyper has decreased so we have many options for browns whenever there are many options that means there is no single procedure that is very effective so it has to be case by case basis uh, so these are the tenectomies tenotomies where you can the weakening procedures the main problem with all these tenectomies and tenotomies especially tenectomies is you are inducing a iatrogenic superior oblique palsy when you are going and doing that and so finally you will end up with a browns becomes superior oblique palsy then you have to tackle the inferior oblique so there are some uh, articles where they had done that also so they did the superior oblique uh, tenectomy or cut the superior oblique along with it they did the inferior oblique weakening procedure also so that is not the right uh, thing to do it is better to do the uh, lengthening procedure where you can use a silicon expander or what we did uh, an app chicken uh, suture uh, lengthening Uh, the problem with the silicon expander is uh, sometimes you can have 
extrusion. But at the same time, even in chicken suture, some people can get allergic reactions and the knots can trigger a uh, granuloma. But we have not had, we have done a few cases, we have not had any uh, this thing. Other than that, uh, these are some of the photographs which you can go through in any book. Why not do a posterior tenectomy? It won't work. Because in a Brown syndrome, both anterior and posterior fibers are tight. So if you just tackle the posterior fibers alone, you, it won't work. So that thought process, you should not have that. We can just do a posterior tenectomy. We won't induce a palsy also and uh, it will improve. It doesn't improve if you just do a posterior tenectomy because both anterior and posterior fibers are tight. So this is the photograph. I don't have a video. And this CNCF split tendon I have not done, so it's once again theoretical, I have this thing. So this is a case number four, a four-year-old child. Uh, head tilt to the left, you can see. And you can see the nice uh, facial asymmetry, which uh, flattening, plagiocephaly, and this child had plagiocephaly also. And uh, right, R by L was there, is the positive uh, Pax three steps test. And a superior oblique underaction and a gross inferior oblique overaction in the left eye. And fundus also showed excyclotorsion. So this child had a craniosynostosis with a V pattern esotropia and an apparent superior oblique underaction. So this case, once again, we go ahead with a strengthening procedure. So what did we do? We went ahead and did a superior oblique tuck in this case. So you can see the lax superior oblique in the uh, force duction test. And uh, when you go and uh, uh, tucking is done once again on the temporal aspect, after hooking the muzzle, you can either use the special instrument tucker or your simple Stevens hook and hook it and we can mark. Only thing you have to remember is if you put two millimeters uh, here, uh, three millimeters or four millimeters, it will doubles up. So when you are tucking, no, you should remember that. If you marked as two, when you are cooking and doing the tuck, it becomes four. So once again, here we use a non-absorbable suture. You can put it on adjustable also. This this is a, a adjustable. You put a place a suture in between. You can have a adjustable uh, uh, this thing also. After folding it, then attach it to the sclera, make it flat. So how do we do an adjustable in this? So after putting this you put it in a loop and do the FDT. Why do you do an FDT? To make sure that you don't cause a iatrogenic browns. Because if you make it too tight, if you are tucking and the muzzle becomes too tight, then it becomes difficult. So we do a FDT again and then uh, finally you can close it. By this is one way we can uh, put it on adjustable. That is what I meant. So these are some of the articles. Uh, this is case five. Uh, head tilt is there to the left, and you can see the right hypertropia, and the inferior oblique is uh, overacting. Uh, four plus is there. So this is a simple congenital superior oblique palsy. And uh, what do you do in a superior oblique palsy? Just weaken the inferior oblique? Should we tuck, or should we recess the superior rectus, or do a combined surgery? So always do all this before touching, do a FDT to see how the superior oblique tendon is. So that is the first step. So if the superior oblique tendon is weak, that has to be tackled first. Whatever you do inferior oblique, it will not act. So this is all there in the uh, books. You can see uh, less than 15 prism or more than 15 prism diopters whether it is there with inferior oblique action, overaction or without inferior oblique overaction. Or more than 15 prism diopters, then we have to do an inferior oblique recession along with the second muzzle, which is to be decided based on the superior oblique tendon, whether it is lax or not lax. Sometimes you may have to go and tackle the other eye, inferior rectus to uh, get the best results. So here we have done the tuck and you can see the child uh, uh, the, along with the inferior oblique uh, recession also and the, you can see the effect is very good. So when do we intervene? Only when there is a significant health tilt or a hypertropia causing asthenopia or when there is a symptomatic diplopia. 
So these are some of the pearls when you are doing a superior oblique. Uh, this thing, earlier onset, the muscle will be more lax. And inferior oblique overaction will be usually marked when superior oblique is lax. And uh, if significantly lax, if the superior oblique is significantly lax, if you just do an inferior oblique weakening alone, it will fail. Because this I have experienced personally, I just did the inferior oblique weakening alone and then it didn't work out and then I had to go back and tuck the superior oblique and the patient was from Kerala also. So I had to do it because she was very fastidious and then we had to do it. And always compare the relative laxity and always whenever you get a chance to do any squint surgery, you know, under GA, always do a all these traction tests, I mean, it's very, uh, so that then you will know what a normal superior oblique is like. Just you cannot go and do it directly on a pathological muscle alone. So timing is controversial. In general, wait until two years of age, as long as head tilt is mild and binocular fusion is maintained. Only early surgery indicated if there is a severe head tilt. And uh, symmetry is the key for a tuck. These are some of the pearls. You, you make sure when you are finishing the surgery, see the both the sides and when in, don't make it a browns, don't make any uh, brown syndrome or a pseudo brown syndrome. If in doubt, if you feel that the ta lax, it is not so lax, don't tuck. It's better not to tuck rather than tuck and crossing a browns. And never ever weaken the contralateral superior oblique because it looks like that a pseudo superior oblique underaction can be seen. So don't go and touch the other eye. This is the final case, just a video to show the uh, hypertropia and you can see the beautifully the left hyper and the, uh, you can see the right gaze, you can see the decrease and in the left gaze it is increasing, the fundus is also having gross extortion. So, uh, this is, uh, uh, you use the transparent occluder and you get the easily to measure also. So, when you are doing the head tilt is the final thing which she was telling about. So, on right head tilt and left head tilt you can see the hyper increasing very well. So, you can do a double Maddox rod and next plan of action is depending on the this thing. So subjective torsion, one video alone I will show. So double medox rod and you give the two this thing and make the person, uh, uh, make it parallel and you can directly measure the torsion. So their fallacy is, used, the original one was white and a red. Right, uh, right eye had a, uh, usually they put a red medox rod and the left was white. But with the, both the um, uh, medox rod being red, it gives a better result to for the uh, which eye is the deviating eye and you can put a six prism vertical prism based down to separate the images also it gives a better result so this is a superior oblique acquired superior oblique alci with torsional diplopia so you go ahead with the transpositioning procedure this is my final video where we can uh, this is a harada ito which you do where you take the muzzle and where do you insert it you place it 8 millimeters lateral and superior to the uh, uh, lateral rectus muscle. So even in Harada Ito, you can go ahead and do a adjustable if you really want to do, but uh, not always necessary. So disinsert the muscle and then attach, uh, hook the lateral rectus muscle and paste it superior to it 8 millimeters behind. So all these obliques in some ways they are very forgiving not like rectus, when you are hooking and it disrupts, it, it disappears from you. At least obliques, it will stay. So when you showed the video also, no, you can just cut it, arm, say take it, it won't run away from you. In rectus, it is unforgiving, you will lose the muscle. So we did a Harada Ito. The main thing, the rational behind, uh, behind this is you are strengthening the anterior portion of the tendon. So always uh, in a superior oblique palsy, remember, you will miss a, if you miss this bilateral, patient will come, you would have seen right hypertropia, you will do everything to the right eye and finally the left will start, uh, left inferior oblique will start overacting. So all these are the, this thing uh, which helps you understand that these are the signs that make you think that it can be bilateral or this nine gaze, whenever there is 
reversal in the superolateral gaze or in the tilts, then you should think that maybe there is a bilateral thing. So to summarize, in a A pattern strabismus, obliques can be tackled by weakening procedure PTSO or in a restrictive pathology, either you can weaken or lengthen or in a paralytic, you can do a strengthening or transposition procedures. Superior oblique overaction and no torsional component, go for PTSO. Wait and watch in a congenital browns with minimal head posture or hypotropia. And always do a nine gaze measurement to rule out a asymmetrical superior oblique palsy. And closed head trauma, always think of bilateral superior oblique palsy. And any torsion more than 10 degrees, go for haradaito. And do not tuck the superior oblique if in doubt. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. I call upon Dr. Rashmi Baskar to hand over the memento and uh, certificate to Meenakshi, madam.